Okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to the Planning Committee today, particularly welcome to those in the public spaces. Um, I'll go through the usual chair's introduction. Um, let's say that we're obviously welcome to today's meeting. This is a public meeting and members of the public and press are permitted to report on the proceedings. Reporting includes filming, photography, making an audio recording and providing commentary on proceedings. Please note this meeting is recorded and streamed live. These recordings are published on the relevant meeting page of the Council's website. By choosing to attend this public meeting, you are deemed to have given your consent to being filmed or recorded and for any footage to be broadcast or published. If the alarm sounds, the premises must be evacuated immediately. Do not spend time collecting personal belongings. All emergency escape routes are clearly signed. Once you've left the building, the assembly point is in the high street opposite the guild hall. Members and other speakers are reminded to use their microphone when speaking. Okay. Uh, I'm Councillor James Stanley for, the, for those who are not regular attenders of the, the panel of the committee and I'm chair of the meeting today. Um, item one on the agenda, appointment of substitutes. Margaret? Yes, Chair. We have Councillor Mrs Lucy Hodgson for Councillor Amos, but we also have had apologies from Councillors Agar, Bissett and Desera. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, item two, declarations of interest. Anyone wish to speak at this point? Councillor Barnes. For the application uh, in Barbon, I have been a customer of the shop on a couple of occasions, but I don't think that that has any significant interest. Okay. And Councillor Lewin. Thank you, Jenny. I've also been a customer of that shop as well. Because <laughs> it's around the corner of my house. Good to see. Thank you. Right. Okay. Um, item three, minutes of the previous planning committee meeting held on the 23rd of February of this year. I'll just go through them page by page and please feel free to stop me uh, either during or I will pause at the end of that. Uh, page one. Two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight, nine, and ten. Is everyone content that I can sign those off as an accurate record of that meeting? Okay, thank you. Item four uh, site visits. Uh, there was a site visit this morning. Uh, in relation to uh, uh, item seven on the agenda, St. Clement's Church Hall, Henry Road. Uh, I was unable to attend, but I'm sure those that did found it of interest. Uh, item five, public participation, Margaret? There's no public participation, Chair. And item six, public representation. There's no public representation, but we do have Councillor Udall speaking on agenda item seven. Thank you. Thank you. And to agenda item seven, uh, uh, St. Clement's Church Hall, Henry Road. Uh, oh. Thank you, Chair. We'll just uh, launch up the PowerPoint presentation. <clears throat> and so we'll look at control. Not yet. Yes, I'm afraid, Margaret. Yes, perfect. So, good afternoon, members. The this application relates to the site at St Clement's Church Hall, which is accessed from St Clement's Gardens, and it lies to the east of Henwick Road. The hall itself was constructed in around 1909. It is a single storey structure and it is surrounded by scrub and grassland. The site is surrounded in the main by residential uses with St Clement's Church to the north, which is a grade two listed building, along with its frontage wall 
and its memorial. St Clement's House and 30 Henwick Road are also Grade 2 listed buildings and the Grade 2 listed buildings are indicated with the red stars. Just some photos of the site. Um, we have on the left hand side the church hall. Um, the undergrowth has been reduced since those photographs have been taken. Um, but the, the access drive that you can see in the forefront is the access drive that takes you to the rear parking for the church. Um, and then you can see the church on, uh, this is a little bit further down the access drive on the right hand side photo looking towards the rear gable of the hall. So this is the overgrown area and the side of the hall. And then looking from the front of the hall and we have two photos they're right in terms of the frontage and then one looking back from um, St. Clement's Walk and Church Walk and then um, towards the hall. And then that's the access drive for the church and you can see the fence that has been provided and that is the fence that belongs to the church and it has been provided on the boundary with the properties um, that are by rooftop I understand. It's an aerial photo of the, the site and you can see that we're looking from Henwick Road with the properties and the church on the left hand side and the church is in the middle and you can see the surrounding sheltered accommodation. And then looking towards um, the church from the different direction, um, unfortunately the church hall is um, in the shadows um, but you can pick it out um, just by the trees. So the proposal seeks for the demolition of the existing church hall and the construction of four storey building to provide um, 54 bed student accommodation. This will be provided in four separate cluster units containing three, four and five ensuite bedrooms with communal kitchen and living space. So just to see the floor plans, that's the ground floor and you can see the, the layout, layout um, of particular mention on this one is the cycle store and the laundry area. First floor, um, again, pretty much the same in terms of bedrooms and the provision of um, those areas of communal space. And again, second floor and finally the third floor. And you'll see that the third floor is set back from the, the second floor and you can see areas of green roof that have been provided. The proposal also shows amenity space to the north and landscaping to the, the entirety of the site to the east and to the west. The proposal has attracted a number of comments from residents both objecting and supporting the proposal and these are summarised in paragraph 6.1 of the report and members will note that there have been no consultee objections. The current building has been vacant for some time and despite marketing since 2015, no community groups or operators have expressed any interest in the site, leading to the current proposal being tabled. It is considered that taking account of SWDP 37, that the weight is in favour of redevelopment of the site. The building is located at a lower level to the properties in Henwick Road and the building is currently sent, located centrally within the site and allows adequate, adequate separation distances between the building and neighbouring properties. And sorry, I should have said on that one, it's, you can see the, for those who are closer to the screen, you can see the, the lines which are um, approximately 15 and a half metres in terms of the separation distances, and that is at second floor level. And as you can see from this slide, it also helps with the stepping down of the third floors, allows the building to provide it without any result of any adverse impact or domination of the surrounding properties. Landscaping is proposed to the boundaries of the site that will provide some screening and the filtering of any views from adjacent properties. The lighting assessment has demonstrated that the building will not impede in the provision of sufficient daylight to existing buildings and also for future uses of the proposed building. All habitable room windows are located to the north and the south of the building. So this is the daylight assessment, quite useful in terms of the, the form of the building and you can see the layout and all of those areas are assessed as being acceptable in terms of impact. These are the side elevations and as you can see facing onto the properties in Henwick Road, there are no um, side facing windows 
There are some side facing windows facing towards the sheltered accommodation, but these are purely two stairwells and can be obscure glazed. And that is the picture of the, the rear of the site. In elevation, the building would be constructed in a pallet including Worcester red brick, buff brick, render, composite and raised screen cladding, and standing steam, let's try that again, standing seam metal roof cladding. The arrangement of facing materials expresses the building horizontally with bands of materials proposed. The building is at four storey height, but given the differences in the levels, between the site and Henwick Road, it provides a suitable height stepping up from the three-storey Dancox house to the properties in Henwick Road. And we've got a picture there of the cross-section of the building and you can see Dancox house to the right and it steps up to the properties in Henwick Road and you can see the comparison in the heights of the buildings. And there's a, a picture that I took from the lighting assessment which shows again the built form of the building and how that relates to the surrounding uses and one looking from um, Henwick Road, looking back down into the site. When viewed in the context of the surrounding area, the design and detailing of the height is considered to be wholly appropriate and will provide an overall visual enhancement to the surrounding area. The building will also provide areas of green roof and voltaic arrays as part of the scheme. The design ensures that at least 10% of the energy required from the building will be met through renewables and that measurable gains to biodiversity can be met on the site. Whilst the building is not on the national or local list as a historic building, it is acknowledged that the building is of some historical interest given its age and its connection with the church. It is accepted that there will be a minor impact on the designated heritage assets of St Clement's Church St Clement's House and 30 Henwick Road, but that is judged to be less than substantial harm and at the lower level. In line with the requirements of the MPPF, this harm is weighed in the report against the public benefits of the development. The loss of the building has not required, received an objection from the Conservation Officer and a suitable building recording is a, a suitable approach to record the building's history. One of the main concerns expressed by residents is that of parking and access the development is proposed to be car free. This is a suitable approach as the site is 0.8 of a mile from the city centre and Fourgate Street stations, the university city campus, one mile from St John's campus, approximately half a mile if you go the roadway to the university's Barrows house, and the shopping centre of St John's is in close walking distance. And you can see the stars um, which indicate those services that have been listed and the, um, the St John's area of <coughs> retail. Bus stops are located on the site close to Henwick Road and also on, in St John's and suitable cycle routes ex exist linking to the site which is um, relatively flat in terms of their approach. This car free approach helps reduce the emissions, which is important given the citywide AQMA and particularly the issues that are experienced in St. John's. A car and parking management strategy has been provided in draft and a condition is recommended to allow this document to formally be tied to the planning permission. <clears throat> this will dictate the management of arrivals and departure of students and that tenancy agreements for all students will include a, include a clause that will restrict keeping a vehicle on site or within one kilometre of the site. Cycle, provide, cycle parking is provided at ground floor level at a ratio of one space per resident. Access to the site as it will be exists from St Clement's Gardens. Improvements to the existing access to the church car park can be provided through the provisioning of the building. In addition, in terms of waste, this will be done through a, a private contractor which will access the site via St Clement's Gardens. The High Authority does not object to the application and recommends conditions, but also financial contributions as set out in paragraph 7.74 and the draft heads of terms in Appendix 1 of the report. These are financial provisions to provide a zebra crossing um, for pedestrians and cyclists and a bus stop cage on Henwick Road. Um, financial contributions towards signage on Church Walk to indicate the shared space and financial contributions towards the widening of the footway along Grosvenor Walk, 
which provides access to St John's and also to St John's campus. These have been agreed by the applicant and are considered by officers to meet the tests as set out within the SIL regulations. Members will note that contributions noted at 7.101 are incorrect and should be disregarded. The recommendation is based upon the contributions set out within the head, draft heads of terms. The scheme is acceptable from a high risk perspective. As part of the consultation, responses from Worcestershire Acute Hospitals NHS Trust have been received. The officer report set out in detail the full considerations of this uh, contribution. Taking account of all relevant matters, including the recent legal decision at Leicestershire, the consistent stance taken by South Worcestershire authorities in previous decisions, and the application of the tests set out within the SIL regulations, it is concluded that taking all of these matters into account, that contributions should not be sought for this development in terms of the NHS provision. The planning balance considers the improvements, the enhancements, along with the economic, social and environmental benefits that will flow from this scheme against the minor harm to the historic environment. It is concluded that the scheme provides sufficient benefits across all three dimensions of sustainable development. The scheme is considered to be wholly acceptable and compliant with, within the development plan. The application is therefore recommended for delegated approval, subject to the signing of the Section 106 agreement based on the draft heads of terms as in Appendix 1 and the conditions listed within the report. Thank you, Chair. Paul, thank you. Karen, did you want to say anything from the county perspective at this point? Uh, thank you, Chair. I don't think I need to at this point. I mean, I'm happy to, but I thought, wait, um, I know the local member wishes to speak and it might be more appropriate for me to speak after the local member has spoken. Uh, at that point, I will welcome the local member, Councillor Udall. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for allowing me to attend again. I feel as if I should have access to the Christmas meal for coming so often to the Planning Committee these days. Thank you very much. Just, Chairman, I think it would be un impossible to to exaggerate the anger, the, the stress and the concern which has been expressed locally about this plan application and in doing so by some of the most vulnerable residents I represent. This application proposes what they view to be a hideous, grim and ghastly building, a massive block of obnoxious concrete to be dumped in the middle of a sheltered housing scheme. Uh, a much more generous description would be a totally inappropriate and overdevelopment of the site. The site is very historic. It's the only remaining part of the old St. Clement's School. The current building should be preserved and protected and used for community use. Many residents were shocked to learn, but it's not listed. It probably should be. The development would dwarf its immediate residential neighbours. There were all units of sheltered housing. It would have a significant and overbearing impact upon Dancock's house, Rowland House and Russell House which are all part of the largest sheltered housing complex in the West Midlands. The impact on Rowland House would be incredible and significant, and the disturbance would be substantial. Not only would residents be overlooked, but the new building would tower over their homes in an intimidating and overbearing manner. Residents of Dancock's house would also be affected, as would their garden and amenity space, which would lose all afternoon sun. It would tower over them. It would have a serious impact upon privacy and recreational amenity. And residents of Rowland House will have windows from this establishment looking over their space and their homes. Disturbance during demolition and concern is a significant concern. Members will have seen the footpath to the site, Church Walk. Imagine all construction traffic using that space, driving past three specially designed and adapted disabled bungalows and two sheltered housing units. The biggest local concern is traffic and highway problems. I see the conditions about tenancy, which would ban car ownership, but frankly, Chair, does anybody really believe that this could happen? If so, how could it be enforced? It's impossible to believe and totally unenforceable. 54 student apartments with just three car parking spaces is totally inadequate. Even if their tenancy agreements could be enforced, the number of visitors, staff and other vehicles would cause problems in an area which is already has acute parking problems and concerns. 
Church Walk also has a cycling prohibition in place to protect residents from speed and cyclists on a very high gradient from Henrik Road. It's very steep. Encouraging cycling along Church Walk undermines that cycling prohibition. It would encourage illegal cycling and would put elderly and disabled residents at serious risk. I want to promote cycling. I want to encourage cycling in this area. But residents believe, quite rightly in my view, that encouraging cycling down this path would be dangerous. The proposed cycle storage is adjacent to the entrance to Rowland House and Russell House. Concern about noise and disturbance by those entering and using cycle storage, especially at night, is of significant concern. The proposed accommodation, in my view, is far too small and unsuitable for modern living. I consider it discriminatory against disabled tenants. The number of flats far exceeds what is suitable for the site. They are inadequate, nothing more than 53 little boxes. The lack of outdoor recreational space is also a concern. I fear potential residents would use the gardens and spaces reserved for their elderly neighbours in the sheltered housing complex, complex, which would cause tensions and stress. A clear concern is about mixed generations living so close to each other. They clearly would have very vastly different expectations about what is acceptable. Student accommodation and lifestyles are not compatible with sheltered housing. The significant, significant generational difference between competing communities sharing the same space is not acceptable and would have a significant impact on the existing community. Also issues surrounding construction concern me. The narrow space and the lack of parking will cause problems. Construction vehicles and cars of construction vehicles and construction workers will, will cause mayhem and will need conditions to avoid problems. Construction times would have to be significantly restricted to protect the elderly neighbours and the site would need conditions to avoid pile driving. Noise, disturbance and dust will cause concern. Please be aware that many of the residents who currently live there are elderly and housebound. They will have no escape from the disruption. They will be trapped in a cruel mental tor torture of disturbance. They are in their final years, Mr Chairman. They deserve more respect than what this development will impose upon them. I would ask you to refuse the application. I have received a letter this morning, an email this morning from a resident, Charlotte Walker, who lives adjacent to the site. She has asked me to read it to you. With your agreement, I, I would like to do so. Unfortunately, I won't be able to attend the meeting tomorrow, read planning committee meeting, uh, read the parish hall and church walk due to work commitments. For what it's worth, our, our house backs directly onto the development. We live at 28 Henrik Road. I am so depressed and anxious about the development, as are all the other residents in the local area. I'm telling you this because I know you appreciate this, but also just want you to know how much I support, how much I support the community's flight. It's too big and too close to my house. It's caused me and others no end of worry, stress and, and concern. I know you will try to convince the committee members to consider the same, but I'm sure then that I'm sure it's not them who will be directly impaired. Please, 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 please advocate that this development is not in the best interest of St. John's. Most of what most of us are not anti students or anti development. We recognize this site will be developed. We just do not want this monstrosity of a building in our back garden. It will undoubtedly affect our quality of life in terms of noise, amenity, space, visual pollution, uh, increased population in, in such a small area. I ask you to reject it. Chairman, if you are minded to ignore these requests and you are minded to support the application, I would ask you to seriously look at the, con uh, the conditions regarding construction times and times of operation. Thank you, Chairman. Richard, thank you. You raised a number of points there. I mean, clearly the highways issue uh, is, is a particular particular significance to, to you and I'm sure to residents. So at that point it's probably appropriate to bring Karen in. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I mean, as you heard within Mr. Ryan's presentation, this development is proposed to be parking free. In our opinion, the development is located in a sustainable location with access to day-to-day -to -day facilities very close by that can be undertaken by walking and cycling and that there won't be the need for the residents, the students to own a private car. 
Um, there are sufficient parking restrictions in place in the immediate vicinity to prevent inappropriate parking and displaced parking should residents uh, should the students choose to own a car you've heard um, what is going to be restricted within the tenancy agreements I mean clearly we will understand that there will be concern from the local residents at drop off uh, at the beginning of term and the end of term but there is a management plan that is going to be in place uh, these work well elsewhere where the students parents are given a drop off time sometimes it's a one hour window or a two hour window where they can use the three parking bays that are on site they will only be allowed on site during that time for drop off and pick up times they do work elsewhere I know as the mother of students at university that they that they work very well and they're enforced they are enforced by the tenancy company so just as you've heard within the presentation we have accepted this car free car free development it is close to the other uh, the facilities within the university and students in our opinion will not need to be reliant on the private car for access to the university and facilities Just uh, in terms of the, the, the condition in terms of construction traffic, and I know Councillor Uvill um, mentioned that, um, just draw members' attention to condition nine, which asks for probably a more detailed um, demolition and construction logistics plan. That's over and above what we would normally ask as a construction environment management plan. So in terms of what would be provided in that is quite detailed in terms of how they will actually operate construction traffic. Um, we have seen a draft of how that that looks but that needs to be worked up in a lot more detail um, and submitted to the council for consideration should the application go through with those conditions as listed if we come back on what's been said by highways very briefly the majority of students who attend worcester university are medical students they represent the majority of the students there and they commute daily backwards and forwards to the hospital from their home and then to the campus these will not be done by cyclists. These will be done by cars. They are already done by cars. To say that these will not be uh, car users is totally uh, impossible to believe. And I also would ask the uh, highways officer to consider the issue which I raised earlier about the gradient and church walk and the impact it will have on the cycling prohibition which exists there, which, was, which will exist to protect the vulnerable residents who are elderly who live nearby. Understood. Uh... Obviously, we're now we're going to widen the conversation to, to members of the committee. Uh, I understand your passion on this, Richard, but, you know, okay. Was there anything else from this end of the table first? No? Okay, so happy to take questions and comment from the floor. Councillor Cleary. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, I've got um, four uh, comments and a question, if I can. I'll, I'll be brief. I'll try to be, anyway. Um, first of all, um, this being four stories um, if, uh, you're in charge chair <laughs> okay doke first two then the first one um this being four stories um i appreciate the idea of this being on a, a slope is uh, allegedly makes this look a little bit less tall um, but i don't think it will i think four stories is way way too big for something that's in the middle of this area um surrounded by um, sheltered accommodation um, the second thing um, to do with this parking um, I, I don't for one minute think this will be parking free I, whatever you put in the tenancy agreement um, and it does say that this will be enforced now I wonder exactly how will this be enforced what you know what do we do kick these students out uh, how exactly will it be enforced if I as a student chose to have a car within one kilometer and more importantly Thinking back to when I was a student, every other person I knew had a partner who probably came to stay on weekends. Now, these restrictions are not going to stop my partner from coming to stay and parking their car around the corner. Now, if there's 54 people here, you could run the risk of 20 partners turning up on a weekend and parking, and you won't have any control over them parking within one kilometre because they're not a tenant. That's two. I've got two more. Um, in terms of the, the the size of the building as set out within the presentation because of the levels of the site and we feel that that is appropriate in terms of the, the height and I, I know that wasn't a question uh, it was just a comment and that's a point to take in terms of the enforceability 
Um, it is going to be part of the tenancy um, agreement. Um, it's for the management company um, who will run the, the, the development to, to operate that. They tend to do that on the basis of um, providing registration numbers. So they will take the registration number of the student as they turn up and they're dropped off. They'll also take any other registration numbers that they've got. Letters will be provided to all local residents and to rooftop and the other sheltered accommodation. Um, and any concerns that they have in terms of that those rules are being um, not kept, they can make um, complaints to the management company and the, the management company will take the legal action that is required because it's a tenancy agreement. It's a legal document that they have to adhere to. Um, ultimately, the university also has powers in terms of um, their ability to make sure that students behave themselves and in terms of how they operate in terms of their courses it doesn't reflect well on the, the university if that's causing difficulties so there is a two-pronged approach but ultimately in terms of the management of the site it's down to the management company they are um, they are a, a well-founded um, student management company and they have operations in bath they've also got planning permission for the images site in worcester so they they are not something that it's a fledgling um, company it is something that they are very used to dealing with this type of, of thing three and four yes, that, that doesn't answer my question um i said what happens when these people's partners and girlfriends and boyfriends turn up to visit them which they will then they're, they're going to park somewhere and the management company are not going to have any control over where these people park surely because they're not part of the tenancy agreement so i just wonder what happens on a weekend when 20 other cars turn up where do they park and what enforcement is there against these cars because i can't see there will be any if these are people are not on the tenancy agreement um three three you chair uh, in terms of where they park um again it's there are as, as karen said there are restrictions across uh, on surrounding roads um, they, will, they won't be able to park on site because that will be managed but in terms of where they can park there are city centre car parks that are, are accessible and as we've set out within the, the presentation it's not far to, to walk from the train station it's not far to walk from Pitchcroft or Croft Road um, across Sabrina Bridge so there are access um, and parking facilities that are available that can be accessed this site and I appreciate that that might not be what happens, but in terms of the management of the site for the regular times, this that's what's set out. Thanks very much. Karen, did you want to come back? Chair, I was going to say mostly what uh, Paul ha has just uh, said. Um, there are ample parking, uh, car park facilities close to this site. There is no parking on site, so they can't park on the site. And as I've already said, there are parking, there are appropriate parking restrictions in place in the vicinity of the site to prevent them parking inappropriately. I know all of this, but I'm a realist. And realistically, someone coming to visit their partner will park 20 yards outside this building. That's what's going to happen. Okay, cool. Um, seven, uh, 6.1, um, just a comment really. I noticed that there's 34 objections to two in favor from residents, which I mean, I hesitate to agree with Richard again. We, I've been, got a, I'm making a habit of this, um, but I, I worry this is going to affect the community. 7.17 um, um, as well. Um, just a query, uh, maybe I've got my wires crossed on it. Um, it says this meets current HMO regulations, um, but my understanding was that HMOs have got to provide parking. So I just want a bit of clarification on that, please. Um, in terms of the, the HMO size, we're talking about the size limits in terms of um, the, the units. In terms of the, the student accommodation, we're saying that it meets the, the size criteria for the HMO standards. Um, in terms of what we're looking at, we're looking at a car-free development. Um, and as you've taken us to this paragraph and it picks up something that Councillor Udall picked up, there is a condition that is proposed at condition um, 29, which detail, provision of detailed plans to show provision and provision of accessible rooms within the development to be suitable for disabled people.
Further questions, comment? Councillor Barnes. Thank you, Chair. Um, on one hand, it'll free up a lot of family homes potentially, and that's got to be a good thing for St John's, which is completely overcrowded with family homes being taken by students at the moment. On the other hand, I think that it is probably an overdevelopment of the site. And the idea that students can't park within a kilometre of the accommodation when there is university parking within a kilometre of the accommodation at the um, Riverside campus, which also provides electric charging points. Uh, I don't see how that that condition can possibly work if there is the car parking at the university as well as at Cripplegate, there is parking there as well, which is in with, well within the one kilometre. So I'm not quite sure how that all stacks up somehow. Um, other things that I, I, I did go to the site visit this morning. Concerned about the colour scheme, I think it'd be much better to reflect the colours of the church if you're going, if it has to be built, then the warmer colours, less stark, colours would be a big improvement on that. The three parking spaces that are pr proposed for various activities, maybe car club could go into that site, because if there are a lot of medical students, then they will need to be going out and about on a regular basis. You mentioned that the company opera is building the images site at the moment when i came past on the bus one of the trees had been cut down on that little corner i don't know whether that was allowed but it certainly happened so i'm i'm slightly concerned how they treat um, planning decisions if they get them and finally i don't understand why they're not being asked for an nhs contribution when our whole NHS in Worcester is completely um, underfunded and in desperate need of, of that extra money. So perhaps that could be explained as well. Um, I understand all, all the comments that you've made in terms of the, the parking arrangements. Um, I can't say anything more than I've, I've said already in, in response to the question of how the management company is going to operate in terms of that. Um, and in terms of parking at the university campus, it needs to be um, an agreed approach between the university and the operator in terms of how they enforce that. Um, in terms of the, the images site, I'll have a look at the, the conditions and the tree. I can't say one way or the other no. whether that was to go or to be kept, um, but we can certainly have a look at that. But in terms of our enforcement powers, it certainly is something that we can um, instigate if the development is not being built in accordance with the approved plans. Um, and then your final question, which has just escaped me. NHS. NHS contributions. So um, just to, to clarify and to differentiate between the normal NHS contributions and what is being requested here, um, the, what is being requested here is not for infrastructure. This is for revenue costs. And this council um, has before and South Worcestershire councils have uh, declined those because they cannot be demonstrated in their, their, their fullest extent as they need to be done as part of the civil regs. We are not um, declining NHS contributions for doctor surgeries or for extensions or for provision of space within the NHS. We understand that there is a re requirement to make development acceptable and to make sure that that is mitigated. But this NHS contribution is different and um, members will be aware that the decisions on the strategic sites have also taken that line and it's been consistent that we don't feel that the justification it has been made and the Leicestershire um, judicial review and the court decision has uh, reinforced that that position that we are satisfied that we can we are doing that not stopping uh, NHS funding but we're stopping NHS funding that's not infrastructure. Councillor Lewin. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, I too went to the uh, site visit this morning and found it extremely helpful, particularly in standing the proximity of the other buildings to the site and the slope. Um, I've got a number of points, if that's okay. Um, one thing is, um, if you've got disabled rooms, could one of these three spaces be disabled parking? Um, because obviously then no, <laughs> that would coincide with it. Um, and I agree with uh, Councillor Barnes that perhaps an alternative would be that we base a car clubs here because students may not need cars all the time. And actually with the cost of living of students who are actually struggling at the moment, I imagine actually there'll be lots of students who can't actually afford to run a car at the moment. Um, I welcome the zebra crossing. I think that's something that residents have been wanting for a long time. Um, I think that's a good benefit for, this, for the scheme and also the pavement improvements. Um, I also like the solar panels and the uh, grass roof um, and meeting the 10% requirements. I always would like it if um, applicant, applicants do more than that, actually. I see that as an absolute minimum. Um, what um, I'm concerned about, actually, is um, I have children at university too um, and um, I know that my daughter when she was trying to study she was disturbed by noise outside her window late at night um, so I just want to see I can see there's a reception on site and I'd just like to know whether there is management on site 24 hours a day seven days a week so actually if somebody's being too noisy they can be told to be quiet rather than somebody, um, I know that when there are noise issues, uh, the onus is put on the resident to keep a diary and to complain, and it goes to regulatory services, and it becomes extremely complicated. So it'd be really good if, we, if things like that could be nipped in the bud. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, the management um, of the site, um, obviously the management plan is required to be submitted as part of, of um, the, the conditions. Um, I don't believe that there's a space for management on site, um, but that would be part of the management plan in terms of contact numbers and such like. But I don't believe there's any space for 24 hour management on, on the site. Um, and in terms of the 10%, it's not just meeting the 10%. Um, we're saying that it, it will meet a minimum of 10%. It's likely to be in excess of that and certainly in excess of the building regulations requirements for, um, for that type of provision. Chair, thank you. I welcome a development not being sort of within the mixed tenure of all the existing properties. I know that's caused many problems with the HMOs before that. And I, and I welcome the, the no car initiative, but I think just in very basic layman's terms, it does look particularly excessive size wise. It, it does look large and um, the rooms do look particularly small. So I just feel it's in the case of its profit before everything about, you know, a lot of small words we packed into a small space when it could have been done far better. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair. It's just a follow up um, from what Councillor Lewis said about, um, about ideally there would be a look at some kind of management on site 24 seven, which there won't be. So my question um, is, where is the nearest management should there be a problem or something that needs to be addressed, how long will it take for them to get to the site? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'll, I'll be absolutely honest with you. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, thank you. Um, something that you said in your report about the, um, the recognition of the um, church hall and the the heritage in the actual design of the new building is there anything in that um, in terms of the design of the church hall it's whilst it's of its time um the the comments that we've received from the conservation officer is that it's not of any particular historic nature um, the, the, hasn't been, the design hasn't taken on any of those particular elements, although the, the red brick, it's a red brick building, um, but apart from that, is, it is a modern building and it's taken a modern design slant. It hasn't taken any particular themes from the, the church hall that exists on site at the moment. Uh, 
um, a signboard or something like that to recognise the the fact that it was the old school and that sort of thing. So at least there was some history there. Um, through you, Chair, uh, that certainly could be something that you could um, think about if that was something that you wanted to add as a suitable condition. Members may recall when they looked at the scheme at Battenhall, that was something that was added as part of the additional conditions. So in terms of the historic um, recording and the interpretation, that certainly could be something that could be added as part of the conditions. Okay. What I'm getting from around the room is that, that there is the possibility of, of introducing a number of additional conditions to this. Uh, I'm, I'm open to uh, members' thoughts on this. Councillor Loon. Chair, can I propose um, that we defer the decision? I'm rather disappointed that there's nobody from the um, management company or the developers here to actually explain how the site will be managed. Um, when the students are here, because I think that the ongoing disruption to residents is obviously one of a, a big concern as well. Uh, through you, Chair, um, I believe the applicant is here, but the Council's constitution doesn't permit the applicant to address the committee unless we have an objector registered to speak, so they, they aren't allowed to address the committee today. No, I'm afraid the constitution does not permit that. Uh, um, oh, yeah. through, through you, Chair. Um, obviously, it's it's a matter for members to consider if they feel that there are specific levels of information that are missing within the presentation in the report that they wish to be provided. They can defer those for those specific questions and that specific information and that can be re, re, re reported back to this committee um, with that information so if there are specific things that members wish to defer it because they haven't got sufficient information to be able to make a decision on this occasion they can defer it and then they can look at we can provide that information as part of the the, the report that follows up in the next um, cycle so I think uh, what's emerging is that there's an appetite for deferment, no? Councillor Alcott. Uh, Chair, thank you. Um, my understanding was not too long ago, we did change some of the rules and mechanisms around planning and planning committee because we were looking not to be in that, there was that situation where we could be minded to re refuse or minded to approve, but it, but it was all done with the thrust, I think, of just being more efficient and, and sort of not wasting resources of a committee. And I think if something has come here to planning committee and we've reached that stage, I don't think it's very helpful for those applying or those objecting if we defer. That's my personal view. Thank you. I think I've got enough information to make a decision, so I wouldn't support it being deferred. In terms of any additional conditionality, Lucy? Can I make the decision? Can I make the, the suggestion that yeah. we do add an interpretation board of the heritage in, of the building or that sort of thing to um, particularly as, as it was the old St. Clement School? I'm sure that could be organised. Anything else that, that members want to raise at this point? Councillor Barnes. On the off chance that we vote it through today, um, I would want benches in the park area, the garden area. So I know that might actually cause more noise for other local residents, but it's important to have spaces where you can sit quietly and, and reflect. I doubt that they'd go as far as the local park normally, and it could be that otherwise they would take advantage of the sheltered accommodation benches. So I think it's quite important that that would happen. Car club, I think, should be, and also um, it could be there are more than one disabled person that would need their car to be in that area. So I think you need to look again at the car parking spaces 
And again, I think the colour scheme is too boring. It, it'd be much nicer if it actually reflected the ancient buildings around, which includes the church, which has some um, warm stone colours. So I, I would want that to be in the mix as well. Very briefly, Chair. I know I'm not part of the committee, but I am, uh, as a ward member, I can tell you some of the issues which... I know I'm not part of the committee, but I'm telling you uh, the issues which I would seek conditions for as a count local member for the area, which would be a, a severe restriction on hours of operation of no construction outside 10 till 4 and nothing at the weekends. Because we are talking about pensioners who are trapped in their homes here uh, and they deserve some peace and, t and quiet time to avoid the noise and disruption which will ultimately follow during construction. Um, other than what I've said before, condition nine allows that to be provided and if that, if the, the application is approved, those comments will certainly be noted as part of officers' considerations when um, those, uh, those conditions are considered. Um, in terms of the other conditions, they have been noted and in terms of um, uh, materials, they are dealt with at condition 15, so we will take that as, uh, as noted as well. On that basis, then, having offered a deferment, which you, you know, chosen not to proceed with, um, we can we can go to the vote. Yeah, oh, Okay, I mean, we, we've explored the, the deferment option and I get, there is no particular appetite for that. Um, are members then prepared to uh, offer either a, a proposal for refusal or, I mean, what we have before us is, is a, uh, for acceptance with the, with the, the, the uh, uh, conditions that have been attached to the report. Uh, what are members' thoughts in terms of, you know, how we proceed with this? Councillor Cleary. Um, I'm quite happy to propose a refusal. If someone will second me, um, I think this is far too big. I don't believe for a minute that you're going to be able to control the cars. And I really don't like the idea of 54 unattended 18-year-olds without management anywhere near the building. So I don't think this is wise, and I'm happy to propose rejection. Is anyone prepared to second... Councillor Cleary's proposal. Councillor Alcott. Yeah, Paul, would you like? Yeah. Um, just to, to clarify, in terms of the refusal reasons that yeah. have been put, um, you talked about that it was too big. Can, can I, so we're talking in terms of just to clarify. Um, so in terms of the the overall, you're saying over development. Um, are you talking about the the scale, the size, the width, the? I'm, uh, I'm talking specifically about the size of it and the appearance, as well as the number of students within it for that area. Um, second one was in terms of um, that the inability to control the vehicles that are accessing the site. Um, that uh, not not the site. I don't think you'll be able to control vehicles around the site because of people's partners, boyfriends, girlfriends coming to visit them. I don't think that is controllable. And that will add 10, 20, 15 cars every night, every weekend to the area, which I don't think we can control. Um, the third one was in, in respect of the management of the site. Um, the only comment I would make in that is in terms of, we're looking at planning aspects and whilst the management of the site in terms of the car provision and we've talked about how that will be managed it's in terms of what we can do in terms of planning terms i would um suggest that that is not a planning reason for refusal in terms of of those behavior but in terms of the other two if you are concerned in terms of the overdevelopment of the site its scale and design and the second one was the um inadequate management provision for visitors car parking
Thank you, Chair. Through you, um, Councillor Cleary has identified a number of concerns and potential reasons for refusal. Um, and Mr. Round has articulated um, how that might uh, read as, as reasons for refusal if the motion finds a seconder and then is carried. Um, however, I just wanted to address you this afternoon just to say that listening to your debate and some of the um, Im important questions that have been asked this afternoon, which we haven't as officers been able to answer in full, um, it does strike me as um, the applicant and their agent is sitting here this afternoon and I suspect they're feeling that the process to them feels a little bit unfair and whilst um, I'm sure they don't want a decision to be delayed, even if your final decision is to refuse, they would probably welcome the opportunity to provide some clarification. Um, and for the sake of potentially a delay for everyone of a month until the next meeting of this committee, I just wonder whether there's an opportunity um, to defer, I appreciate you've declined that opportunity uh, at the moment, but an opportunity to defer would allow you to look at this application with a little bit more detail. The applicant would be able to also think about some of the concerns that have been raised. For example, Councillor Barnes talked about materials. I'm not suggesting that that will necessarily completely alter your approach, but the moment that this committee decides and, and, uh, and permission is refused, the applicant really is backed into a corner they either have to go away and come up with a new scheme and present that to you at some point in the future, or they might feel that they have no option but to lodge an appeal. Um, th there's no way back on the current application. So I just wanted to take a moment to ask you to, with the greatest of respect, just pause for a moment and just consider what the best way forward might be. But Respectfully, I understand you might go on to refuse permission this afternoon. Thank you, Chair. I think it's worth remembering that there are a number of things that councillors have legitimately raised, uh, things that, that are of concern here, but that could potentially be addressed were we to simply offer the, the, the applicant the opportunity to, to just go away, pause for a moment and come back to us. I think if we if we take the route of simply refusal, then we are, as Duncan has explained, we're offering no opportunity then to come back, you know, with, with a number of the things that councillors have quite reasonably flagged up this afternoon, you know, that, that opportunity is gone, essentially. So I return again to the, the original question. Please do, Georgia. No, no, we'll have to, yes, yes. Sorry, Chair, that, yeah. I was just going to say that um, yeah. because Councillor Cleary uh, put a proposal which um, Councillor okay. Alcock seconded, yes. um, Councillor Cleary would need to withdraw his motion in order for us to, to move Precisely. forward to defer. Yeah. So, there it is, there's the question. Um, if we can get the applicant to <coughs> question them, then that would make sense to me. So, I will withdraw the um, motion to reject it. You're obviously aware of the fact, as has been explained, that... that... Uh, no. Sorry, uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm not. If I may come in again, yes, Chair, please. I apologise. Um, as you'll be aware, members, at the last planning committee, you did vote for some recommendations for some amendments to the Council's one. constitution. But those have been recommend. Those were going to full council next week. We don't know yet. If, if full council approves those recommendations, then at, by the time the next planning committee comes along, the applicant will have the right to register to speak regardless of whether or not an objector is registered right. but the applicant doesn't have that right today because the constitution has not yet been amended uh, i gotta be honest I, I don't i'm a little bit confused i wasn't at the last planning meeting um could you <laughs> reiterate this again please well at the last planning committee as well as the planning applications there was also a report to members recommending some amendments to the constitution um, to improve processes um, and those those recommendations one of which included currently the constitution provides that an applicant can only speak to committee if an objector is registered to speak against it 
that one of that is one of the changes there were several changes proposed um all of which members of the planning committee approved but the constitution can only be changed by full council so what um planning committee members did was that they recommended that report go to full council which is next week um for those those considerations to be considered at council and if they're approved they will be implemented immediately but at the moment today so so if, if council approve those amendments next week by the next planning committee the applicant would be registered to speak and then you would be able to ask him these questions that you wish to ask um, so my understanding is then that um if i remove my motion to reject um is it possible for me to replace it with a motion to defer and yes. then ask for a seconder yes. and we will then defer until yes. after the council meeting is that is that correct yes. yes that's what i will do so councillor louis preempted what i was then going to move to so we have a councillor clear it has just for clarity has withdrawn his original uh, uh proposal to refuse he is, he is now proposing a deferment and that has been seconded by councillor lewin so we have to go I will not be able to participate at that next meeting. Well, uh, the committee membership may be different. Sure. I'm afraid, Richard, that a point of order can only be raised by a member yeah. of the committee. Yeah. Um, so it's not an appropriate, and I don't, so I don't think we can answer that question. No. Should we ask and ask that question on my department? Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure the local member, whoever he or she may be, will come forward to do that. As it stands, Councillor Orcott. May I ask that question on Councillor Eugen's behalf? Please do. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, if it does come to a subsequent meeting, will the ward member be able to speak if they've spoken in objection this time? Uh, it would be helpful to have clarification because I, I don't know that myself. <laughs> Thank you. The ward member um, will be able to speak at the next hearing of the planning committee, even though he has addressed the committee today. Okay. So, Councillor Barnes. It just shows how important it is that we do amend our rules from time to time. So we will be able to um, give everybody a fair crack of the whip next time. Yes. Um, in audit last night, we were talking about the customer journey in planning cases, and this really sums up why we need to move forward and, and change some of the rules. Thank you. So to, again, to reiterate, we have a proposer and a seconder for a deferment. Uh, can I see a show of hands in favour of that? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. Seven for deferment. Anyone against? One against. Deferred. And that is deferred. Okay, thank you very much. We now move to item eight on the order paper, uh, 24A Barwon Road. Uh, Charlotte, are you taking that? Yeah. Yes, and Charlotte. Yes, apologies. None needed, none needed, it's okay. Of course, yeah. That's all. So, okay, okay, please, Richard. Richard, thank you. Can we just move to agenda item eight, please? Uh, 24A Barwon Road and Charlotte. Thank you, Chair. Just waiting for the PowerPoint presentation. Do you want to, pardon me for a moment, Charlotte. Councillor Lewin. I was just saying that's because I called in this application. Um, I called it in on the basis of the original scheme and it has significantly changed um, since it came in. So if it's okay with everybody, I would like to stay and, and vote. Thank you.
can mark it that for the next time. Oh, it's woken up. Thank you, Chair. Um, this application is presented to committee for determination following a call in from the ward councillor. It's an application seeking planning permission for the change of use of the ground floor of an existing retail premises to two number one bed apartments with associated external alterations. The site outlined in red on the top left site location plan lies on the northeastern side of Barbourne Road to the south of its junction with Shrubbery Avenue. It is shown in its context from a bird's eye view at the bottom of the slide. The application proposes the loss of an existing retail unit. As set out in the report and shown on this slide, the site is not located within either a primary or secondary shopping frontage or the Barbourne local centre. As such, the retention of this current retail unit is not protected by policies in the development plan or the national planning policy framework. The acceptability of the proposal in this case is therefore dependent upon the suitability of the proposed use. The site, marked with a red cross, lies within the Shrubbery Avenue conservation area and adjacent to the Fourgate Street and Tithing conservation area. The St George's Square conservation area lies to the northwest, and there are a number of Grade 2 listed buildings in the vicinity, but none immediately adjacent to the application site. The site and surrounding area <clears throat> is also in the archaeological sensitive area. The existing and proposed ground floor plans show how the existing unit would be subdivided to provide two one bed units. Flat one having access from the principal elevation to the road and flat two being accessed via the existing alleyway, which already serves the upper floor flats. A communal area would be provided, which includes storage for wheelie bins and bicycles. At 35.5 square metre floor area, flat one falls one and a half square metres short of the nationally described space standards. On the basis of this being a modest shortfall, it being a conversion scheme and the extra storage is proposed in the basement, it is considered that overall satisfactory accommodation would be provided. Flat two exceeds the space standards at 42.1 square metres. The existing and proposed basement plan show the stepped access to the dedicated storage provision for each unit and an area for cycle storage. It is accepted by both the local highways authority and planning officers that the storage of cycles in a basement is not an optimal outcome. Nevertheless, given the constrained nature of the site, that the proposal is for one bed units, that there is scope to store cycles in the communal area and the site's proximity to public transport and a range of services and facilities in both Barbourne and the city, the provision is considered acceptable to meet the likely needs of the future residents. On this basis, it is considered acceptable as a car-free scheme. These photographs show the existing access to the right-hand side of the shopfront that serves the upper floor flats, the short section of alleyway and the bin storage and the proposed communal area and access to flat two. The existing and proposed principal elevation show the external alterations proposed to facilitate the change of use. Following negotiations, the plans have been amended to better reflect the proportions and positions of the upper floor openings, retain the fascia and the cast iron supports. Windows and brickwork are proposed to match the existing with condition three requiring the submission and approval of samples of facing materials. As set out in the archaeological advisors comments, the shop front is considered to have some architectural and historic value, which contribute to the understanding and appreciation of heritage asset, assets, although it is noted that the building itself is not listed. Further assessment has identified that although the splayed alignment and double fronted design of the shop front appears to be early 20th century, including the fascia and plasters detailing to the side are more recent additions. This can be seen through comparison of the top photograph from 1999 and the photograph of the existing frontage. The photographs also highlight the changes to the context in which the shop is experienced, with infilled shop fronts to the units to the left hand side as a result of their change of use to residential. 
the conservation officer has advised that the proposal would result in a neutral to slightly positive impact on the character and appearance of the conservation area. The archaeological advisor's concerns are noted. However, it is considered that these can be proportionally mitigated by way of a, the recommended building recording condition and a watching brief if groundworks are required. A modest degree of less than substantial harm has been identified. Paragraph two, 202 of the National Planning Policy Framework requires this to be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal where appropriate and securing its optimum viable use. The economic and social benefits from the provision of two flats in the context of the current housing land supply sh shortage are considered by officers to outweigh the modest identified heritage harm. The existing and proposed side elevations, which are not visible from outside of the site, are proposed to be subject to minimal alteration and already provide access to the upper floor residential units. It's in this area that biodiversity net gains can be secured as set out in the report and condition nine. To conclude, the, the principle of the change of use to provide two one bed units, which would result in the loss of a retail unit is considered acceptable. The proposal would provide a modest contribution to the supply of housing in the current context of a five year housing land supply shortfall. The accommodation proposed would provide acceptable living accommodation in accordance with policy requirements in a sustainable location due to its access to public transport and a wide range of services and facilities in the locality. The identified modest less than substantial harm to heritage assets is considered to be outweighed by the public benefits and proportionally mitigated by conditions. In the context of a housing land supply shortfall, the MPPF states that planning permission should be granted unless the application of policies in the framework that protect areas or assets of particular importance provide a clear reason for refusing the development or any adverse impacts of doing so would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits when assessed against the policies in the framework. There are no clear heritage asset reasons for refusing permission and the modest adverse impact is considered to be of insufficient gravity to both significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits in this case. It's therefore recommended that planning permission is granted subject to the conditions as set out in the report. Thank you. Charlotte, my thanks. Um, questions and comment on the floor? So we have Councillor Barnes, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Chair. Um, at the Conservation Advisory Panel, this was discussed, and their main concern, which isn't properly um, minuted in this note, was that the front of the um, shop is actually in by about one foot six, something like that. And that was considered quite unusual and was a real feature of that building and that they um, were worried about losing that particular feature, which is why they put that it wasn't acceptable in its current format. I, I rather like the building being a bit quirky and not just sort of run the mill um, without any, what, what's proposed is okay. It doesn't, but it, I think it's less architecturally interesting than what's there at the moment because of the setback nature. So if we could get the uh, new format set back rather than brought forward, I, th I would be much happier with it. Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, officers understand that position. The difficulty that might present is that flat one is already short in terms of its space standards and um, retaining that alignment of the existing shop front would reduce that space even more. So it probably wouldn't be as simple as um, just simply push it, retaining the existing line of the shop front. I think it would require a reconsideration of that whole ground floor area in terms of ensuring that the future residents still had a, an acceptable standard of amenity. Um, that's something that could be considered. Um, I think officers' opinion is whilst the loss is regrettable, weighing it in the balance of itself, it's insufficient reasons to refuse permission. Um, yeah, I I don't see the point of um, even mentioning national space standards if we're going to say it doesn't meet them, but we will, we're going to do it anyway. I, I just don't get it. Um, if something doesn't meet national space standards, then it doesn't work, as far as I'm concerned. Um, this would work if it was a two-bed flat. 
but these two one bed flats to me looks like overdevelopment. I, I'm concerned that this is far too small, the one flat, sorry. Um, my concern is that flat one, the bedroom is right beside the pavement and whether or not we could maybe consider perhaps the ensuite, moving the ensuite to the sort of so that the bedroom is to the back and ensuite is to the pave to the pavement or something like that, so that um, it isn't the or at least double glazing, triple glazing, and that sort of thing. Um, and probably in the uh, um, living room as well. Okay. Um, thank you, through you, Chair. The, the windows are already um, described as being double glazed, so that would offer some sort of degree in terms of noise impacts. In terms of um, re reorganizing the internal layout, the difficulty with positioning the ensuite to the front is then that the bedroom may lack light, whereas at the moment the ensuite would be artificially lit. Um, so that might present some difficulties. Um, obviously, I understand members' concerns. It, it's not untypical to have a bedroom on the front adjacent to a, a footpath in this sort of location where properties are um, converted that take on board the, the concerns. Um, so can I just as it is right beside such a busy road, could there be some sort of air, air quality monitoring or something like that as well? Because it is in it's very, very close to a road to a road. I don't know. Um, I'm quite happy to make a comment. Um, in terms of the, the whole area, it's something that Worcestershire Regulatory Services are looking at. As councillors are aware, the whole of the, the city is designated as an AQMI. So in terms of specific areas, they are looking at them. But in terms of individual units, it's very difficult to be able to, to be able to require an application to provide that because it's a wider piece of work but certainly it's something that Worcester regulatory services are looking at as part of their wider AQMA action plan for the city. Thank you chair. Um, this application is much improved on the initial one um, but um, what I'd like to ask please is would these residents be able to apply to join the residence parking scheme? Because um, I know that other um, buildings along the tithing have successfully done that. Um, and also, um, I note that highways have said that the, the cycle parking in the basement is not ideal. I mean, I can't imagine being able to carry my bike down the stairs. Um, I think it would be better if it's just not shown on a different level um, and actually just be honest that people aren't really going to store stuff down there and uh, that's why the cycle parking on the communal area is actually really important thank you Karen, did you want to come in at this point yes i mean obviously as you heard we appreciate it isn't ideal that the, the cycle parking but in terms of that being the only issue that we had a concern with we didn't believe that that was sufficient to you know to, to be able to, to defend a refusal reason um, in terms of the residence parking scheme, I'm going to have to be honest and say I don't know the answer to that question, whether they would be able to apply. Apologies, I, I, I don't know. I don't want to, to guess and give you the incorrect answer, but I can certainly find out and let you know. Any further questions or comments? Please, yeah, Karen, I have got another one. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's when you look at the elevation of the road and you see what's been done to the shop fronts, it's really highlighted it, actually that photo that you showed of how it used to look and how it looks now. And the houses, the flats now that are flat against the pavement, they're not attractive at all, are they? I, you know, it's, it's a shame, it's quite ugly. And I do note what the archaeologist has said, that the, this is quite a unique shop front. And the problems that uh, Councillor Hodgson has said about the 
the windows being right on the pavement. If it was still set back, like Councillor Barnes wants, the windows would not be quite so on the pavement as well. So it's almost like we could solve lots of problems and maybe issues if it wasn't quite so on the pavement. I recognise that it would be a redesign, um, perhaps a two bedroom one, you're, you're concerned about the space standards as well. So there are lots of little reasons why the, the, the scheme at the moment brings up some concerns, I think. <clears throat> Just um, a couple of comments. In terms of what members are considering, they are considering what is before them. We can't ask for changes of the nature that members are, are requesting. Um, the, the one thing to bear in mind in terms of the, sh the, the, sh the shop front, if it was to be kept on the alignment that it is, it does provide areas for people to step away from the pavement and stand adjacent to people's windows, whereas at the moment, yes, they are standing adjacent to the windows, but they are on the footway, whereas there could be potential for antisocial behaviour being able to be in that alcove area. But that's something for members to consider. But ultimately, we are considering what is before members. It has been designed in a way, and as, as Councillor Lewing has said, it has been um, uh, an, um, a number of iterations that, that officers have looked at in order to get it to members. We just haven't provided what was submitted because that was unacceptable. We do feel that this is now acceptable. Um, members are aware that we are in short supply of housing. This does provide that in a very sustainable location. It does provide suitable housing as far as we are concerned. And we feel that uh, the recommendation can be supported and we don't feel that a refusal can. But obviously that's for, for members to consider in the round. Thing that emerges for me, and the word has already, I think, been used in, in, in the conversation, is that this, by its very nature, is a, is a balance here. There, there is there. We're, I don't think we're going to get to the point where this this satisfies us on a on a completely one hundred percent level. It's not going to, but on a on a balance factor, then I think the officers have already expressed a view that that it, it for one a better way of describing it, it ticks more boxes than not, uh, and I think that that's something that we need to just be mindful of as we we go forward. Is there any Further comment or question, Councillor Roberts. Hey, Paul, can you help me? Uh, uh, I know we're not a, a, a bill of regulations people, but if we approve something that doesn't conform to the building regulations, where does it go from there? And, and what I'm really saying is, we've had uh, a, a council clerk who said this problem about the size of things. Is it, it, it is it a permissible development, or will it fall at the next hurdle? Through you, Chair, in terms of the space standards, that's not a building regulations matter, that's a planning matter. So um, they would have to go through building regulations. If there was something that hadn't been considered as part of the planning process, and there are certain things that we don't consider as part of building regulations, they still need to pass building regulations. So they need to be able to justify why or to mitigate why. So as a, for instance, if they couldn't make the, the fire routes safe in the normal way, they would have to provide greater amount of sprinklers, they'd need to provide greater amount of fire protection. So there are things that you can do under building regulations, but they need to be able to meet building regulations. If they can't meet building regulations, they can't carry out the development. Uh, I, th thank you very much, I, as I thought. But on that basis, uh, Chair, I'd be happy to uh, move uh, the officer's recommendation. Is subject to condition, conditions set out in the report that we the recommendation is acceptance. Will members indica, indica, indicate if that's their view, please? One, two, three, four. Those. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Can we just do that again one, one more time, just for four. just for clarity? One, two, three, four, five. Those against. Three. No, that's the complete group, I think. Okay, thank you. That brings us to the end of today's business. I'm not aware of any other business. So on that note, I'll bid you farewell and thanks very much for your time. Thank you.